Okay, we're gonna finish up. I'd like to try to do two chapters in this one hour class, if it's possible. We'll see, I have to be careful. I can't get off on tangents on everything. Uh, I don't tell a lot of missionary stories. Maybe I should tell more, but I have a lot of fond memories of the mission field. But let's continue with chapter two here. Uh, wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings. All right, let's get that right out of the way right now, all right? Just stop it, all right? Um, <laughs> that's a lot of stuff right there. Um, and, uh, you know, because we have a lot of baggage, right? Before we got saved, it could, you know, has to do with our upbringing, our family, our education, the place we grew up, whether it was a city or a country or what state you were in or country you were in. Many things have piled into our soul long before the Holy Spirit ever put a filter on it. And those types of things have to really be unlearned in our lives. And you'd be surprised how much of those old things, that old nature, uh, remains. And he says here in verse 2, we have to be as newborn babes, desiring the sincere milk of the word. And we have to be um, acceptable to taking that, of saying, okay, I need to unlearn many, many things, and I need to learn many, many things, to be teachable, right? I think that's what James says in uh, his letter, who was also writing uh, to a similar people group. But it says in the third chapter of James that, verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, holy, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Similar to what Peter says about what we should lay aside. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, lay aside the weights and the sins that so easily beset us. Uh, there has to be a really offloading of a lot of baggage and really consider ourselves to be newborn, born again, born of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit, uh, in John chapter 3. So we need to honestly begin to remove the old man. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 22, it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. There's the mind again. We love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. The mind can really be a very a strong manipulator. And we can be, especially as we get older, we can get more, more you know, solidified in our belief systems concerning anything. I mean, I'm not just saying about Christ. I'm saying about anything, about baseball or about, you know, the, whatever it is, like it, you know, we can get very opinionated and very staunch in our resolve as to what we believe and what everyone else should believe because it's what we believe. Um, it's not as easy to lead older people to Christ. I mean, it happens, of course, it's the work of the Spirit, but you got to break through a lot of crust and, and barnacles. And you know, I mean, I'm speaking from that period, by the way. I hope you're not looking, some of you are looking at me like, yeah, you young whippersnapper, you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I, I'm getting old. I'm getting old. I'm starting to see myself, you know, that way too. But uh, we have a lot of uh, opinions, and we have have a lot of beliefs that may not be right. When you look at, you know, why do the false religions believe what they believe? How could a Jehovah Witness possibly believe what he believes? All he's got to do is look at the history of his prophet, Charles. Uh, what was his name? Charles Russell. Russell. You know, the guy was a lunatic. And he was demonic. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Now I'm probably going to get kicked off of YouTube again <laughs> for that. But these, these so-called prophets of false religions, and, and you say, how can people believe that? Well, you know, be careful because people believe a lot of things. And be careful what you believe. You know, make sure that you can back up what you believe with Scripture also. Don't just uh, blindly or ignorantly believe. Um, but... We have what we have in our soul accumulated over the course of years before we got saved, and even oftentimes after we've been saved, can really affect or infect the way we process 
God's mind and God's information. So we have to continually uh, have our minds renewed. And that's what it says here in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking uh, every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. We need to be renewed. We need to put on the new man. And we need to, you know, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, the new man is the only thing God can work with. We can't fix Adam. Adam is, is you know, the only thing we can do for Adam is, is kill him. We have to reckon him dead. And we have to oftentimes reckon him dead over and over again. Because he's always trying to resurrect. And he can't. He's you know, when we were when we were crucified with Christ, our old man was crucified with it. Galatians two twenty, also uh, Romans chapter six verses two and three, and here in Ephesians chapter four, we have to put on the new man continually, over and over again, because the old man has got nothing good for us. As newborn babes, desiring the sincere milk of the word, word that you may grow thereby. If so. Be you that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So what does the sincere milk of the word taste like? It tastes like grace. And that's a good taste. And it's a good aftertaste. You can, you know, you can you don't even want to brush your teeth after you've tasted God's gracious milk. You just want to have that taste in your mouth. Um, because uh, the words of God, you know, it says in uh, one of my favorite verses is in Psalm 1. Well, it's a, I shouldn't say it's a favorite, but it's a good verse. Psalm 119, verse 103. It says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And, of course, in Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and they were the joy and rejoicing of my heart, because I am called by the name of the Lord. So we taste the word. The word is, you know, that word of life, that heavenly manna, that Jesus speaks about. He says, yeah, Moses gave you manna in the wilderness, but I've got this new manna. In fact, Pastor Schaller spoke about it, you know, because he said it wasn't even Moses that gave you the manna. Moses was there, but I gave you the manna. You know, it came down from heaven. Moses didn't give it to you. <laughs> he gave, God gave it to them, and God gives it to us. He says, I am the bread of life, right? And he's the, also the, the water of life. So, we should come, we should love the word, we should love all the word, we should love the meat, we should love the things that are a little bitter, you know, we need to eat it all, because all of it is good, all of it is good for us, you know, the word of God diet. And from verses 4 through 7, he uses uh, a lot of different passages in the Old and New Testament concerning stones, how Jesus is the chief cornerstone, how we are lively stones, how it's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He's really, you know, getting into the quarry here with this passage here from verses 4 through 8, really. And it's, you know, and it's so good, though, because Jesus is that chief cornerstone. He is also the stone that the builders rejected, speaking of the Jews. Um, but now we are lively stones. We are the stones that, in Malachi chapter 3, that make up his jewels. Um, let me get that verse for you because it's beautiful. Um, Malachi chapter 3, verse 17. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. So, and in the body of Christ is where we really manifest that portion of God's, uh, of God's illustration there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when it talks about the gold, silver, and precious stones that we build up uh, at, in our lives, wood, hay, and stubble, of course, being the, the anti or the negative things, that precious stone, as lively stones, each one of us are planted or placed in a church in the body of Christ, and each one of us is precious, each one necessary, and as we serve in the body of Christ, 
we build up for ourselves those treasures in heavens that are called the precious stones in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we are, you know, and the local assembly is so important for that. And in this day and age when it's being, uh, it's being spoken of as not being necessary, boy is it, it is so necessary for us to be in the body in the place, you know, that local assembly where we can come in together and rejoice in the Lord and sing praises to the Lord and really love the brethren fervently with a pure heart. You can't really do that if your church is an, is an internet connection. You know, that's it's, it's hard to really feel the connection when your church is in some other state or somewhere. And you want that's pretty powerful verse that Jesus uses in Luke chapter 20, verses 17 and 18. He says, and be, he beheld them and said, what is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner, speaking of himself. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but unto whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. That's a and that's unfortunately that's the way it's going to work, you know. Those who fall upon that stone, they will be broken. I mean, there will be a breaking in us. There will be a uh, a breaking off of the old man, and even you know, even those areas of pride that God must remove. It was the sin of pride that caused caused Lucifer to fall, and we all have it. We all have a degree of pride in ourselves and in our old sin nature, and. Uh, Boy, if you if you know if that's your case, just you know repent and receive the mercy and be humble because God has a God is good at humbling us. You know He says if you will in James He speaks of how He will give greater grace to the humble, but He will uh, resist the proud. So better to be humble. You know humble yourselves in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, I believe it's in uh, I never know I think it's in Micah chapter six verse three. How it says to love mercy, to humble yourselves, and walk with God. Um, let's see that Micah for Hosea. I always get it wrong, so I want to get it. Uh, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, to humble yourself, and walk with God. So, please. I mean, I've got to please, you know, I'm kind of speaking in the, in the mirror also. Uh, pride is a terrible thing. And it's so, it's so anti-God. It's so, it's so, you can't do anything with it except resist it. So, when we humble ourselves and enjoy his mercy and grace, much better living conditions. Uh, verse 9, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, uh, a peculiar people. Now that word peculiar, of course we can maybe relate to that, but it's really not a good translation of the original Greek. That word really means a redeemed or a purchased people. Uh, we see that same word in um, I thought I would, yeah, in verse, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. It's the same Greek word where he says, um, let me just read it for you. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, until the praise of his glory. So when it says here, peculiar people, it means purchased people. But you're probably still peculiar anyway, but that's between you and God. So, um, so he has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That was the theme of this year's conference in Warsaw, Poland, was uh, the light. And that is wonderful. We were translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son. And... The light shone in our hearts in Galatians or uh, first second Corinthians chapter four, verse six, I believe it is, that we are five, five and six, maybe. Um, that once that light shone in our hearts, everything changed. And we gotta let God have access to every part of our soul that He can shine the light in it and really do a work, you know, do a cleansing work and a purifying work. Verse 10, for what in past time we were not his not a people, but now we're a people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. This is taken from the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verse 23. When it, you know, Hosea is a difficult book. It's a book about how Israel had left God and really played the harlot of 
and using the relationship between Hosea and Gomer to illustrate how Israel as a nation had gone astray. But we have obtained mercy. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, speaking of our salvation, it says, Not by works of righteousness which you have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And it says something similar in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse um, 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, in verses 4 and 5. So we are saved by mercy. It's the mercy of God. But it's the love of God you know, that's shown in our hearts. And we received that message, and we were saved, and still, it's because, you know, we deserved hell. The word mercy speaks of how we, we don't get what we do deserve. You know, David would say that when he numbered Israel. He says, I will fall upon God's mercy. I know that God is merciful, so I will take his judgment. I will not, I don't want to be, be, uh, given the judgment of the unsaved or the uncircumcised, I would fall on God's judgment because I know he's merciful. And you know what? He was right. He, God was merciful. If you read that passage, in, uh, it's deep in Second Samuel, yeah, where it talks about David and his census. So we, are, we all deserve hell, every one of us. But God was merciful and God saved us. So as it goes through, he's speaking again of after, from verses 11 through 25, it speaks of how to live in this fallen world. Um, you know, and it's not, it's not like live long and prosper. It's not like, uh, what's his name? The guy with the pointy ears, uh, Spock. Yeah. It's not like the Vulcan blessing. It's, you know, it's more to that living in this world. And we may not prosper, but that's okay because we've already won, right? We've already prospered. We've already received the prize of uh, eternal salvation. Verse 18 says, Be subject unto your own masters. Now, we talked, this is also speaking of, you know, your bosses. It's not just speaking about slaves and masters. You don't just blow these verses off like, oh, we don't do that anymore. Not since the war. Um, well, it's talking about how we relate to our bosses also. We all, most of us, none, not many of us own our own business. Uh, we have a boss. And we have to do the work. We're getting paid, you know, and uh, that's really what it's saying here. And also, if we are serving as unto the Lord and not as unto men and doing all of our work with due diligence, it is a good testimony. And it even could lead to someone um, asking for a reason for the hope that's within you, as we're going to see here a little longer. Um, you know, it's not like we want to say, just look how wonderful I am. Don't you want to be wonderful like me? Get saved. That's not what it's about. But we should be um, good ministers in the way we work in the, uh, in the world. So we have to submit to earthly authority. We also, have, we also will suffer. And, you know, it says in verse 20, For what glory is it when you are buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently. But, what, but, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. So, you know, if you, if you speed on the highway and the policeman pulls you over and gives you a ticket and you don't argue and you pay the fine and you think yourself such a good Christian because you didn't complain, um, well, hey, you know, that's not what it's talking about. It's what if you, you know, what if you weren't speeding? What if he pulls you over and you weren't speeding and you take it um, patiently? Well, you really more he's talking about in respect to ministry if you're persecuted for righteousness sake and it's in Matthew chapter 5 it's not so much if you get pulled over for not speeding but uh, it is a, quite an example though when you see those persecuted Christians uh, and the testimony that comes from their wrongful suffering uh, you know people do get saved that way people do get saved you know you see Richard Rembrandt and his uh, uh, tortured for Christ and the ministry of uh, martyrs of uh, voice of the martyrs um, and you see the persecution of Christians throughout the world I mean what happened in Australia is horrible and it should never happen 
uh, but, the, but the world is silent concerning the atrocities that are happening to Christians all the time. Uh, and of course we know it's demonic. We know that that's why that is. It's, it's because the world system is demonic and the persecution of Christians is not considered a, uh, a problem <laughs> to the fallen world with Satan as its head. But uh, when we suffer with patiently, this is also acceptable. And there is also a, uh, a crown, a martyr's crown given in heaven. I can't remember where that passage. I think it's in uh, 2 Timothy when Paul talks about uh, verse 8 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give to me in that day and not to me only but all them also that love is appearing. There's five crowns in the New Testament. I'm not sure that that's the martyr's crown. It might be in the book of Revelation. But uh, there is a there is a blessing in getting killed for your faith. So there you go. There was a time early, early in church history when people wanted to get killed for <laughs> their faith. Uh, and th there was a, a season of martyrdom in the first. It was still during the Roman Empire. Uh, we're well, not so much into that anymore. But who knows? It may happen. I mean, God forbid, but it may happen to some of us. Uh, especially as we go off into the field. Even in this country, you're not immune to that. You're not immune to somebody doing something horrible. Uh, we're going to jump into chapter 3, just like I said, because I want to try to get continue through and do this chapter too. Um, so, as we move over. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, um, that if any obey not the word... They also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. Um, now, first of all, that Christianity is the most wonderful religion for women. Believe me, Islam is not a good women religion. Uh, yeah, I can't think. Oh, actually, Jehovah Witnesses have, are also not very gracious to women. God actually calls the women. He actually, I'm sorry. God actually manifests the body of Christ in the person of the woman, right? We are the bride of Christ, even though us guys are going to, you know, we're still going to be the bride of Christ. When we get to heaven, Jesus is the bridegroom, we are the bride, the church is the bride. So you women are actually the visible manifestation of God's bride. So I think that's pretty good, right? Because we're going to look at some stuff, we're not, you know, and we're going to look at the order in the household a little bit. I mean, I'm not gonna, not gonna dwell on it too much, but to understand the beauty of that one flesh union God has placed in marriage. The uh, second institution, the first institution, is the free will. That didn't go so well. It still doesn't go very well. Uh, the second institution is marriage. Well, that can go well, or it can go not so well, depending on how scripturally based we keep our understanding of it when it says that verse you know people look at that and they say oh that's a horrible verse it's the same thing it's in Ephesians chapter 5 women submit unto your own husbands that word in the Greek is hupotasso uh, you know I was someone I I don't can't remember who it was it was a long time ago they were talking about, oh, how, you know, what's the best way to be a good husband? And uh, they say, well, wash the dishes. That's like the big thing. And every, you know, no matter what it is about marriage, top 10, anything to got related to guys, number one or two is wash the dishes. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what it is about that. But the guy said, yeah, but I don't ask my wife to change the brakes on my car. And he was like, what he was saying is like, and I'm not saying, you guys, you should wash the dishes. You should go ahead, wash, tomorrow night, wash the dishes for your wife. Or if you have a dishwasher, even better. Um, uh, but uh, there is, you know, but, you know, when it comes to the, the way the, that we are created and the way that God has made marriage, there are certain functionalities of each gender. You know, the idea that men and women are somehow biologically the same. I mean, now you're seeing that even, and this is really demonic, that we don't know, you know, we can't determine when we have a child whether or not it's male or female. We have to let it decide at some point later in its life. 
uh, and they have to be kind of gender neutral until the child decides if it wants to be male or female. I mean, that is, un you know, that is so ridiculous. However, it's what we have. I mean, it's, it's the life that we, it's the world we live in these days. But there is a beauty in the difference. Viva la difference. I used to be a saying, in, you know, a French saying a long time ago. Uh, celebrate the difference. Men are not women, and women are not men, and that's perfect. That's the way it's supposed to be. And men are supposed to be men, and they're supposed to act like men. And women are supposed to be women and act like women. There was a, there was a bicycle race recently, and a transgender woman won the race, like by a long shot. So they're standing on the platform, and this woman who used to be a man, who looks like a man, I mean, now his hair is longer, but that's about it, destroyed the rest of the field on this bicycle thing. And, what, and the girl who came in third had a problem with it. And she said, this isn't fair that this man woman, I mean, I don't think she said it that way, won this tournament and she got destroyed by it. She had to apologize publicly for saying it. For how dare you accuse this poor transgender person, you know, but I mean, if you look at the picture, I mean, you know, like, you know, men have like thighs that are like different than women. And he looked like a guy, but it was a woman. And of course, he won the, the women's cycling thing. There's a difference. And there is a and there is a purpose for the difference. Women are much better at many, many things than men are. And men are much better at many, many things than women are. And there is a you know, there is an order and there's a beauty to it. So when it talks about submitting, this word hupo tasso, hupo means under, but this word tasso is the important word. It means the, uh, let me make sure I get the correct definition. It means an ordered fashion or order, um, uh, ordered, uh, ordered structure like. It's, it's a military term. Speaking of how a military sets up its, its uh, plan of attack. Now you've got the air, uh, you've got the air force, you've got the artillery, you've got the infantry, you've got all of these different parts of a military system. And every part is necessary, but not every part is the same. And if you know, if you know anything about warfare, I mean, I don't know too much. My dad knows way too much. Um, uh, you know that you have a certain way that the the uh, you know the battle plans are laid out, and certain people, and at certain times, and in certain ways, have certain functions. And every one is necessary, but not everything is the same. It doesn't mean anything is lesser or greater than anything else. It just means there is a different use. And God chose in man to be the covering of the household. And I have a responsibility to cover my wife and to cover my family. And I am responsible to lay down my life for them if necessary. And you know, I don't even think about it. I just know I'll do it. I know that if it ever came down to that situation, I know I would not hesitate to be that man, to go in and lay down my life for my wife or my children, because that's who God made me to be, and that is not unusual or, or foreign to me. It is just simply the way it works, and this is the way, and this is where it says for the women to submit under that authority, because it's a good authority. It is a quality. I mean, of course, there are always a situation, and it speaks about this here in First Peter chapter 3, and we'll look at it. There are situations where you'll have a marriage where one is saved and one is not saved. One is saved and mature. One is saved and immature. These things are going to happen. Um, and there are all different dynamics in every relationship. But in a, in a relationship where you've got a male and female walking together as one, um, this is the order. In the you know 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 speaks about that... The, Man is the head of the household, same thing in Ephesians chapter 5, but it also says in Ephesians chapter 5, as Jesus laid down his life for the church, so does the husband lay down his life for the wife. You know, so when it comes to the way God chose to make the relationship, 
He chose man to be the one to lead in that respect. In Genesis chapter 2, or Genesis chapter 1, um, verse uh, 18. Um, yeah, verse 18 of chapter 2 of Genesis. And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. It says in the, in the uh, King James, helpmeet. But that word actually means a helper suitable. Um, a helper that is suitable for him. Because he lacks certain things, because God designed him to lack certain things. And the woman lacks certain things because God designed her to lack certain things. That so when they come together, it's not like it comes together like a solution. Like if you put, you know, water and iced tea mix, it becomes iced tea. Yes, but it's still a solution. It's still, there's still separate things. In marriage, it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse... 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. It's more like if you have hydrogen and oxygen, how it becomes water. You can't separate that. It's one, it's, it is now combined, I mean, it's probably with a nuclear reactor or something like that. But you have, you know, it, is, it is not something, it is like in the book of Leviticus, it talks about the warp and the woof of a... Uh, a loom. This is the way God designed male and female, that when they come together, they are one. They are not two different things coexisting. Anyone who thinks that they can get married and continue with the life they had as a single person is fooling themselves or they're destined for disaster. They have to understand that once they get married, their life changes drastically forever. Don't try to get the old life back. That life is gone. The new life in one with your wife is totally different. Bring children into it, it changes again. You can't have the single life as a married person and not have a, 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 or a, uh, a healthy marriage. It will never happen. But when we get married, we have different functions. We, have, we are in the warfare and we have different functions. And it is important for the men and the women to understand those portions. It's under, it, in, it is vital for the woman to submit to her husband, and it is vital for the man to provide an example that she will submit to, that she will say, I want to submit to that man. That man has, will, will never, you know, that man will cover me, that man will, will give, this, give me security, that man will lay down his life for me, I will, that's the man I want to submit to. So, really, the, the, uh, importance is on the man to fulfill that role as the provider and the security for the home to give the woman something to submit to. Uh, in verse 1, and then it speaks really a lot about women. And women, I know I've seen this many times in, you know, in, in life. I've seen a lot of times where a woman is married to a man who is either not spiritual, not saved, or, they, or she gets saved after they get married, and now she's following the Lord and he's not. Um, and it's difficult. And we have in Albania, at least twice, it happened where, people, where women actually had to leave the church because, one, because their children, one of their sons, came to her and said, I don't want you ever to go to that church again. And she said, okay, I can't. I, and we would try to go to her and entreat her, and she would say, no, I cannot go to your church. My son says I can't. I had a woman who was going to the church for over a year. Her son lived in Italy, but he, he lost his job in Italy. He had, you know, many Albanians moved to Italy. What they do is they live in Italy, and they send money back to their family periodically. The guy loses his job in Italy, comes home to mom in in village called Spila. As soon as he gets home, he tells his mother, you can't go to church anymore. We never saw her again. 
And when we tried to entreat her, we tried going to her house, her son would, would come against us and say, no, she can't come to the church. And she wouldn't. And now we have this precious believer with a church. In fact, one, she could see the church from her window. She couldn't go because she was told by her unbelieving son that she couldn't go to church anymore. <laughs> Um, Albania's got a difficult uh, family structure down there. Um, and what does she do? You know, she's, she's got to live a life of, of uh, quiet, silent or Christianity. She has her Bible, but uh, she doesn't have a church that she can go to. And it's very difficult for her. Um, it's sad that these things happen. And because of the old sin nature, men use that qualification as head of the household even though they don't have the spiritual backing for it as a weapon against their wives um, to do you know, to manipulate them and do what they want and it's very sad but it says here in verse 1 that likewise you wives be in subjection to your husbands that if any obey not the word they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives that type of ministry is I mean, that's quite a ministry of, of a woman to, to be a, a, a godly, loving, caring wife in a, an ungodly or unspiritual home. But that's what they're called to. I mean, because there will be times when a woman cannot, um, doesn't have the freedom to choose. I mean, they say, even in Islam, there are many women, when you see those women in the burqas, many of them are Christian. In fact... It sickens me to even think about this, but it is a it is an honor for a Muslim man to marry a Christian woman in Islam. That they look, you will even, and we have to be careful even in Albania because men come into the church to find themselves a Christian wife. And they lie because, of course, in the Quran, it's okay to lie to the infidels. So they'll lie and they'll talk about Jesus and they'll even get baptized, they'll... Give this, take the salvation prayer, they'll serve in the body, they'll do everything that they think is right until they find themselves a woman. And then when they marry them, immediately they're out of the church, back in the mosque, the woman's wearing a burqa, and she never sees the light of our church again her entire life. And when, So when you see these women dressed in the burqas with only their eyes showing, many of them are Christian women who are, who are manipulated and deceived into getting caught up in, a, in that because the Muslims believe that by doing that, by marrying a Christian woman, they are removing that aspect of the infidels and, and making more and more um, Muslims. Um, it's, it's, it's sad, it's even disgusting, but um, you know, they say that in those, you know, in the women's part of the mosques, there are many, many Christian women who know each other, even though they can't really speak out one the other. Uh, you know, it talks a little bit in verses three and four about, you know, um, being modest. You know, and that's, I mean, I'm not going to speak too much about that. You all look great tonight. I don't think anyone is, you know, dressed inappropriately. Um, <laughs> so, but you know, I mean, it's you don't want to you don't want to look like the world, men and women, because I mean, men can do it. In Europe, men dress better than the women a lot of times. They have they. You know, it's very important how the men look with all their gels in their hair and their, <laughs> you know, their European cut shirts and everything. Um, so it's just as bad with the guys as it is for the women out there. But just to be modest, you don't want to be on display. You don't want to be, you know, you know what, we all know our own sin natures. You know, we don't want to be giving people the wrong idea. Or, you know, I don't even, you know, I don't, I don't use any type of scent at all. I don't use like aftershave or anything personally. I don't. I just don't. I use water. Um, <laughs> now, verse seven. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Oh, <laughs> wow! Now you're getting personal, God. You mean I got to be nice to my wife, or else you're not going to listen to my prayers? That's what it says. There you go. Write that down. <laughs> That's what. And it, by weaker vessel, it means fragile. It means more precious. It means more valuable. 
right? I mean, you got, I got a coffee cup. I like my coffee cup. It's got a couple of cracks and little chips out of it because I dropped it a few times. But it's my coffee cup. But I don't use the china or the crystal for my <laughs> coffee in the morning. I, mean, I don't actually have crystal, but if I had crystal, I wouldn't use it for my coffee, right? Because it's not designed for that. It's too delicate. It's too precious. You don't want to hurt it. You don't want to break it. That's what it's saying here. Treat the women, you know, the, as the precious, fragile, valuable uh, person that they are. And dwell together according to knowledge. And guys, you know, I'm not going to get into that either. you got to figure that one out for yourself. You know, there's... Many books have been written about how to understand women, and I, I haven't read any of them, but uh, according to knowledge, <laughs> we'll just leave it there. But that your prayers be not hindered. And he says the same thing over in verse 12 of chapter 3. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the faith of the Lord is against them that do evil. So Paul, Peter, at least twice here, talks about having our prayers hindered. And this is something, you know, in any way, what we should, you know, we should, as we go to prayer, we should go to prayer first in reverence of him. We should acknowledge him. It's not all about us and what we need today, but it's all about him. And ask ourselves, what does it say in the, uh, Psalm 139? The last verse of that uh, psalm, actually verse... Uh, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in your way everlasting. That's a very powerful statement, that we would you know, allow the Lord to search us and see if there's any wicked way in us. Um, and when we go to prayer, or if we feel distant from God, well, find out. Ask God. Is there something between us? You know, what's the problem? Is there some? Is there, you know, is there something hindering my prayer here? And uh, he is loving and gracious. He will give us that answer. Verse fifteen, I think, we're going to spend the rest of the class on in First Peter chapter two. Be but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's the word. It's uh, from the root word hagios again. Sanctify, set apart, be holy, be pure unto the Lord in your heart to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you in meekness and fear. The word for answer in that word, in that verse, is apologia. Apologia, uh, word, um, but this word is means a defense. We were, use the word apolog apologetics. Uh, a lot of people, you know, like Ken Ham is an apologist, apologetist concerning creation and evolution. Uh, Ravi Zachariah is one of the best uh, apologists I've ever heard. Great stuff. He has a, uh, a show called Let My People Think. Uh, I encourage some of his books. Uh, Jesus Among Other Gods, excellent book, uh, very good apologist. Uh, this is a reasoned defense. Now we don't, you know, when it comes to the gospel and leading people to Christ, there's one gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus. It's the, it's the, you know, life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, the shedding of the blood on the cross uh, for the sins of the world, faith in Him for salvation. The gospel is pretty simple. Um, however, there are times where you're able to use a little bit of this or even a lot of this apologetics. You want to be careful. You don't want to reason someone into salvation. It has to be a step of faith and a free will choice. But you can bring them to the point, uh, what did Pastor Stevens used to call it? The point of, um, yeah, he used to have, it. it's not his term, but it's a term he used to use. Um, Cognitive, cognitive dissonance is the word, which means to a, to such a point, bring them to such a point that they have to actually say, "I understand everything you're saying, but I don't agree," you know, I, or "I don't accept it." You know, I believe everything you say, but I don't accept it. Cognitive dissonance. So you bring them to that point. And apologetics is really a great way to learn a little bit about evolution and creationism. 
to learn a little bit about um, what you know what the Bible teaches, how the Bible got to us. I just um, there's this silly thing they they consider the Bible in Islam. I, I I use a lot of Islam because that's what we dealt with on the mission field. What they say about the Bible is that the Bible was written over you know a long time by many writers, but as they call it telephone tag. You ever play that game where you tell somebody one thing and it goes down a long, long line, and by the time it gets to the other last person, it's totally different? That is their basis, that their basis argument for the Bible. They say the Bible has been changed and written and rewritten and translated and retranslated so many times that the Bible isn't anything like it was when it was first written. But of course, that is such a silly, even foolish argument, because the Bible we have in our hands today still comes from the most ancient manuscripts. We don't change it every time we translate it. We go back to the original manuscripts, or as close as we can come to them. The Texas Receptus for the King James Version, the, the uh, you know, the, what do they call it, the Codex uh, Alexandria, and the Codex of uh, Syria, I think there's like different codexes that are really, really old. That's where the Bible comes from. Uh, but they use that, and they think, you know, when they say it, they say it as if they have some authority for it, that, they, that this is true. But you're like, that is the most foolish argument to say that the Bible over the centuries has been translated from the last book. And even if it were, it's still a book. It's not people talking. You're still looking at words and translating words. You're not translating thoughts or what somebody's saying. So anyway, um, it is good to know where your Bible came from. It's good to know what are the old manuscripts. There's a book out by Josh McDowell called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. I would recommend you to have that in your library. It's a great book. Um, and it gives a very good, uh, just the, you know, clinical understanding of basic Bible truths um, in a apologetics kind of way. So I would recommend that. I would recommend Jesus Amongst Many Gods by Rami Zachariah. Uh, Ken Ham's stuff, Answers in Genesis. Uh, it's a little bit more elementary, but uh, I would love to see them do something else. There's a good book, <laughs> a movie called Privileged Planet, which talks about intelligent design. It doesn't come right out and give the gospel but it talks about intelligent design. Uh, Unlocking the Mysteries of Life is another good video, speaking of the cellular level. Um, anyway, there's a lot of good stuff for apologetics out there, and I would recommend it. It's good to be a little bit smart in that stuff. There's no problem with that. It doesn't save anyone. Apologetics isn't going to save anyone. Jesus is going to save everyone. But still, it is something that you can use for the naysayer, for those who want to have a conversation, because conversations are good. And sometimes if you have a half an hour conversation about the debate about evolution and creation, you may end up, you know, you, you can certainly turn the corner to the gospel and you may end up having a, a salvation uh, prayer at the end. So set the Lord God apart in your heart and always be ready to give a reasonable defense, reason defense, answer to every man that asked, the reason of the hope that is in you, because there is a hope that's in you, that hope of eternal life, that hope of glory, with meekness and fear, reverence. I had a guy, I'll never, I'll never forget, it was in Baltimore. Um, the guy didn't get saved that day, or maybe he, all, I don't know. But anyway, um, when I was done, he looked at me and he says, you know what, you really believe that. <laughs> and I said, yes, I do. Um, but... Uh, when we speak the gospel and we speak to people with reverence for the Lord, the fear of the Lord, let, telling people about the joy that is within us, the hope that is within us, it makes a difference. There is, it is not simply the words we use. It is the, the confirmation of our, of our testimony. You know, it is that they see the reflection of Christ in the witness that we have so we should always be ready we should always be ready and if you never go on evangelism i would encourage you to do it and even 
I, I, I'll never forget how I started doing evangelism. It was up in Saratoga, and my dad was leading evangelism at that time. And my, my boys were little boys back then. And we would go to this, do you remember the hot dog shop, Mr. Ed's? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we'd go to Mr. Ed's hot dog shop up on Broadway in Saratoga in the dead of winter. And I mean dead of winter. It was freezing cold out. But we go into Mr. Red's and we get they had all kinds of different hot dogs there. I always got the Mexa hot, which was a good, yeah. good hot dog. Um, and I didn't say anything. I was just there. I'd pass out tracks. My kids would pass out tracks. People would say, "Ah, oh, man, look what you're doing to your kids." You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it turned out okay. Um, but uh, my dad spoke. Pastor Moore spoke. Larry spoke. And I just stood there, or I would pray, or I would just continue passing out tracts. I, it was a long, long time before I said a word on evangelism. Um, but I would go out. So I would encourage everyone, go out, be there. Be there as a prayer warrior, just stand in a conversation, you know, just talking to the other evangelists. Just be out, and eventually, God will give you an opportunity. And uh, you never know. I mean, if you've never led somebody to Christ... It's quite an event. You know, I mean, I think the evangelist uh, feels better than the person evangelized sometimes. I mean, not always, but uh, it's a great feeling. And it's, you know, we don't do it for the feeling, but it is a great feeling to lead someone to Christ and to know that they've, you know, been translated themselves into the kingdom of God's, the son of God's love. So to give that hope. Um, so we're going to end there because we wanted to do two chapters and we hit on some key stuff. Women, you're wonderful. God, God, you are the manifestation of the body of Christ. Men, we are the ones who are the, the covering by God's grace. So, Father, we thank you for this night. And we do pray that you would give us grace for all that we've heard and learned. And, Father, we would use it for your glory and for your namesake. In Jesus' name, amen.